belongs to me A nation's pride, the dirty water of the rivers No one can take away her memory Oh, England belongs to me politically motivated, I would say it'd be politics with the small people, which is the politics of the street, because um, you can sing about unemployment. Unemployment affects everybody. Black, white, rich, poor, middle class, working class, you know, it's not unique to one group of people. Um, mugging is not unique to one group of people. You can, you know, an old lady getting mugged, whether she be black, white, Chinese, is out of order. Right? The matter who's going to mug you. Right? Um, so I don't think it was a politically motivated or politically run, I think it, a certain element of it got hijacked by political factions of both the right and left um, and used for their own ends and discarded when they finished with it, as you could see would happen in the first place. But unfortunately, you know, a lot of people got hurt and a lot of reputations got ruined because of that. But, um, and, and the totally <laughs> biased press didn't exactly help to play in and let down or to give it any justice or any, re any reality or any truth which uh, that supposedly uh, journalism is supposed to represent both sides of the story. Um, but maybe they didn't like the other side of the story. Doesn't sell newspapers, does it? Skinny old old lady across the road. We did a thing <coughs> for uh, ITV called TVI. And yeah, this, this was the turning point, I think. They said that they wanted to do a thing about sort of... Uh, the, what was it? The crowd trouble? Football. Football and that, you know. And so they said to us, what we do is, if you would invite a load of your mates into the bridge, yeah, so I've got permission, I've got Terry Moe, you're filming there, I mean, it was a Saturday afternoon or something. Yeah, Saturday morning. Yeah. Well, so you've got a load of young kids in there, school kids, they're being old mates, all sitting there having a jar up, you know what I mean? And they filmed, filmed a couple of them. Filmed a couple. Yeah. So we went into an interview in the old pit, didn't we, like, with this, this bird. Yeah, ring through an ocean, yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah, Typical lefty. What do you think about the politics of it all? I mean, do you know, do you find that Nazi element went, whoa, whoa, scrub. Yeah. No politics, no politics here, it's all children here, you know what I mean, everyone's having a laugh. Let's try again. Let's yeah. try again. She kept false in it, no, she said, end of, we're not here to talk about that. So she changed the track and talked about the music and sort of football. Then got on, on the football. track again, yeah. Right. And uh, we thought we had it all sewn up, oh, and all of a sudden this thing screened, this TVI. And they're patting him round like, you know, you see, I don't know what you see, you see, Stephen Betts and Well, they said that we, we used our gigs as a recruitment for the British yeah, that was it. I said, these people, and you want to pass a couple of kids on the grass a bit, or we're sort of mm. doing a few jollies on stage, so like, a harsh recruitment ground for the British movement, a far right Nazi organisation. It's like, we went, what? What's going on? What's going on? Libeled us right then and there. So we went to our good old man, Tony Goldman, and he said, show the fucking pants up and like, Oh no, you don't take on ITV. Oh no, lots of money. Should have showed them. Should have showed them. Should have gone Because that was bang out of That probably contributed towards the LGLC band, mate. It probably is. No doubt. But that's the outward thing. I mean, it was nothing. I mean, we lost the tour over that, do that Power and the Glory. We was about to go on tour, about 15, 20 dates. And I had to pull the plug. We had that album coming out, it was like, you know, with the promotion, there was um. HMV. Yeah, that's like, right, with the link up. Like, yeah. Yeah, like, you know, doing poster campaigns in, in the... And they all pulled that out because of that. You yeah. know, so it was... Remember, the South thought it went off yeah. right across the country. Yeah, mm. that's right, yeah, you got chock yeah. stuff and all that, didn't yeah. you, like, you know what I mean? Everything, man. Right. everywhere. And we were sitting there thinking, what have you done? Right, yeah. You know, inadvertently, what have you done? Because that killed us, it was like a dagger in the guts. It was. Right, like, and like, like, that. So right. decided, I mean, Gary didn't realise what he was doing there. And I have to say that, and he must know that now. Uh, he must know that now, that it was a big, big mistake. And that was the touch of paper, like, you know, light and stand fucking 20 yards away, bang, off it went. We got told with a brush we were never held in the first place. And more so than anyone else. I mean, all these, young, like, bands were the business, and they got away with it. Yeah, we took the flat for yeah, that. Yeah, we took the flat for that, because we were the figurehead. We was the biggest mm. band there. And we got bang by the Fair media, by that. everyone else, the councils. We got tired with that brush when it was nothing to do with us. They could all creep by because they were sort of little bands. Yeah. And basically, that's what happened. We never really got over that, I don't think. And to this day, you ruin it because it was nothing to do with us. Never, ever. And it fucking hurts. It does hurt.
in one of the um, Sunday papers, we was cite, we was written down that we uh, we was the band playing when it happened. And I mean, we hadn't even been together for for three years at that time. But um, it it was all it's all very negative, and uh, it was a bit of a shock, really. No, nobody expects that. I really got a lot of fair bad because like we was just a fucking band, you know, in the fucking venue, really. I mean, after we we never really did any interviews with like press and yeah. stuff. Yeah, no. I mean, well or anything. you know, like we had no. I never had any personal interviews or anything like that. I left that to Hodges and the gang. You know, what I mean, I was. Yeah. I'm not interested in that fucking crap. All I wanted to do was get out there and play. You know what I mean? It was unfortunate. That put the card wash and all that for us. That's we could not play anywhere really. after that. You know what I mean? Well, that's right. It was all secret gigs. I mean, like, basically the GLC down to the result, the same as what they done to the Stranglers and the Pistols, we couldn't play anywhere, you know? Mm. Anywhere. Yeah, it seemed to be more done. reinforced with us, you yeah. know what I mean? That was the thing. In fact, it was only the Guardian newspaper that gave the other side of the story what actually mm. happened at Southall. Yeah. You know, they gave our side of the story. I mean, we got them set up with saying tech we played. It was just a and gig And it went off, you know, it was it. That's it. You know, it was you just know. another gig. We played Acme, we played Brixton, we played all over London. But, you know, it's just, I mean, I'd never even been to Southall. The whole thing that happened that day, I mean, none of the bands wish now that we'd played there. But at the time, as, as regards the four skins of last resort in the business, and I know I'm not speaking out of turn, is that as far as we were concerned, it was a, it was a show. And we were going to do a gig, and it's as simple as that. Um, the big thing that sticks in my mind is the following day we was recording down the Old Kent Road. Uh, we was recording our Suburban Rebels for the Carry On Oil album. And um, the police came in uh, and said, uh, well, sorry boys, you've got the blame. And we said, well, why? And they said, well, because you're skinheads. And I said, but did you see anybody ramming around in balaclavas? And we went, well, why? And I said, well, it was a totally political, piped up riot. It was a big thing between the right wing and the left wing. So actually, basically, the riot was organised. But the bands knew nothing about it. I mean, if the bands had known anything about that, they would have never have gone there. Um, as far as we're concerned, you know, Southall's a part of London. I mean, Okay, there's a, there's a large Asian community there, but I mean, none of the bands would worry about something like that. You know, they just think, well, we're just going to do a show, we're just going to play in a pub and um, enjoy ourselves and everybody goes home happy. But um, it turned into riot and it's nothing that anybody's proud of. And uh, we wish it never happened as regards the bands because it, it, it destroyed Oi for a long time. And... Um, People have had to work so hard to go through that, you know, or to, to get out of that scene, you know, and um, that might be a scenario that you've never, never heard before from from the other guys. I don't know, but um, that, that that's it really. I mean, I was there, and it's a, it's a very frightening evening for all concerned. You know, the the Asian community, the skinheads, the police. Nobody wanted that. And it was whooped up by ultra-extreme parties from both sides of the fence. And there's no two ways about it. You know, I mean, that, that was a, supposed to be the first day of a poxy tour. Yeah, we got you know the I mean? Manchester. It's been so much for the chaos tour of yeah. fucking 81. <laughs>
single in the okay. beginning. There was no pressure on anyone. You just yeah. get up there, take them some stuff, do a set. We even supported ourselves once, you know what I mean? We put bags over our head, called ourselves foreskins. However much Gal tries to present it as foreskins, we'll say, it, that, it, that's how it started. We supported ourselves with one of our roadies, H. And uh, he just thought, oh, mine's fault. Oh, there's another one, you know, kept foreskins, foreskins. Yeah. He's got it, blinded, you know what I mean? Spokesman. And that's is, that, is that true? Yeah, that's the way it started. Yeah, yeah that's the way it started, yeah. yeah. Brass. Yeah. Yeah. Well, played on, I know, yeah. on, on your albums and that. Yeah, on them all albums, they played at that stuff. Yeah, the first one, right? And then they just went from there, didn't they? Yeah, that's you know? it. He set up his own little thing, got his old little rock and roll game, and on it went from there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Albums and bands continued to appear, but the momentum had been damaged. Very few gigs, even less press coverage, and absolutely no airplay. Some bands, such as Screwdriver, came out of the closet to reveal that they were, in fact, ultra-right wing, and I was left to limp along for several years in the darkness. Sadly, by this point, many of the punters coming into the scene had believed the media and took a political stance. Bands become obsessed with bands' political views. Oi had fallen apart, the paradox of its potential. The band's hearts were there, but the fans were fighting themselves. Things ticked over slowly until the mid-80s when Laurie Pryor and Mark Brennan started Link Records and Roddy Marino started Eye Records. With a new outlet for the music, things looked like they could pick up, but in reality, it was pretty much past saving, with the kids hanging on bands every words rather than trying to live their own lives.
wasn't something we believed in at the time. Well, I mean, our values still ain't changed. Same people inside, I mean, you know. Yeah, I mean, we wrote about ordinary working class things. Ordinary people, we knew about people who'd gone away for things. Miscarriages mm. of justice. No one else ever wrote about that. I mean, mm. that's what punk started out as, and then it all got pretted up by the sort of like the, the enemy brigade, you know, and the poses. Mm. It's like me and Art were that right remain silent. I did it on that 89 album. Yeah. All right? Look at it there. It's fucking the coming. Criminal justice and we field. fucking foresee that. That's right. And I bet we don't get one ounce of fucking credit for it.
enjoy what we do and that's what we do it for, you know. We don't do it for any other reason. And free beer. And free beer. And food. How do you want to Because in this game you can't afford to fill the pantry up. <laughs> stays the same but uh, I still think there's a future for guitar bands and, and playing live and the music business in general but um, it definitely needs something new I mean it's, it's good for us that you know that people are getting into the old stuff but uh, it definitely this needs a kick up the arse again. I've noticed one thing with um Lately, over the last couple of years, they seem to be flirting with this laddish fucking image with the Oasis and the fucking Smash and the, these animal men. But we've the got them of, ideas from them. yeah, it, it, you know, uh, fucking Ice of Coco and all that, and it, they're flirting with it. But at the end of the day, they're not saying any of. They're just uh, all that like the hey man drug culture. They're not saying anything in their lyrics, but they're flirting with the idea. Now you get. Some band are coming up who starts really can have it, a real start staying a few. Say Oasis tomorrow started making like real strong lyrics and, and hard music. Well, you know, they would dropping. go ballistic because that's it, the time's fucking getting right for it. They're starting flirting with it, the image is right, the lads, blah, 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 and you just need one group to come through. And so, and it, I mean, like the rejects, and they, they, I mean, they could have a row and. Do you know what I mean? They meant what they said and they got back up and, and that sort of thing. You know, but it just, I think it could possibly happen. It could happen. It's going to shake that one now, look. But at the end of the day, it comes back to the fucking idiots upstairs in those fucking little safe offices doing their stupid little fucking jobs. They're not going to let that happen. It'll have to happen through someone, you know, like Gary Bushell, who decides. Fuck you lot, I'm a journalist, I'm going to fucking cause this scene whether you like it or not. And that's the only way it's going to happen. The turn of the 90s saw a new crop of street bands. This, coupled with a rise of new record labels such as Hammer, Step One and Hell and Away, has breathed a new lease of life into the music, if bit only on an obscure cult level. 
Bands have now had to turn their attention to Europe and the United States, where the ideals of oil have spread. Indeed, Europe and the States are now producing some quality bands of their own, and no longer have to rely solely on UK exports to satisfy their thirst for working class rock and roll. This puts the British working class band in the same position as a British working class man. doesn't seem to be the venues um, and uh, I don't know how they're attracting an audience now. The trouble is first and foremost getting a gig, period. I think if you're in, in any type of band now, unless, it's, uh, unless you're going to be doing a rave playing dance music or you're in uh, a, a rock band in, in playing the standard rock clubs in, in London, anything a little bit different, punk, uh, if we could be a punk band or an oil band, you've got very few venues to choose from. You know, the Roby often does uh, Part. That's, 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 that's one of few. The bigger places, it's going to be difficult to find a promoter with some, some money to pack it out. It's very rarely, once a year, you get a gig at Brixton Academy. Occasionally, you might get a name band at the Astoria. It's like the smaller places, like the Marquee. We could play somewhere like the Marquee, have a few hundred people in there. Great. There's no promoter that's prepared to do it. Um, you know, and it's very difficult sometimes. We've, we've tried to do everything ourselves, like, you know, fanzines. So you try to write articles for people so they can put it in. You, we've got to write the music, we've got to rehearse it, we've got to record it. It'd be nice to do it all ourselves, <laughs> but, um, bless you. but we can't do it. You know, um, so people might say, well, why are you moaning? Why don't you do it yourself? That's the whole attitude of all. You can't physically do everything yourself. We need other people. Other people have got different skills. Some people are good at writing. They've got a fresh way of writing. Start the fanzine. I'm a musician. I'll, I'll play the music. Someone else, if you put me up on a stage, I'll play anywhere, anytime. No one in England that will put us on. You know what I mean? And if they do, it's all got. To, um, the only trouble we have had is if uh, a promoter who we don't know wants to put us on, and it is an oi gig, you always end up that it's got to be, uh, you know, uh, keep it quiet with a venue, um, where, where the venue is. Don't advertise it in Melody Maker or NME, and that's doing us no favours because you're preaching to the converted. I want to play oi music, but not just to an oi crowd to everyone, because I think that there's a lot of people who listen to rock, punk, heavy metal that are missing out. I mean, it's one of the most exciting forms of music there's ever been, you know what I mean? And they're missing out. But you'll never get it across to them unless you can get mainstream media on, on your side. And that's when you encounter a problem with the oil label, not necessarily putting gig to the media. <laughs>
The other night, and the toilets were leaking upstairs, and the dressing room was pissing through the fucking ceiling, right, on the floor, and there, this group, a big group, wading through piss on the fucking dressing room floor, right, and there's, like, a couple of sandwiches in the fucking corner, and they've got no beer. Held up right? sandwiches, no beer, no, no water. Be nothing. No nothing. Right? They're and treated like shit. shit. And then, that, that would, they had to finish early, okay, so they could have a fucking disco after. And then I looked into this disco, and there was a fucking hundred morons sitting there listening to music, looking at the stage, as if something's going to fucking suddenly appear on stage. And I just thought, I just can't believe this fucking, what this fucking country's come to. It's just like uh, stupid. It, it, it is, it is it's crazy. really lost it. It's and crazy. we was the leaders. And, they, and I don't know whether it, we, some of the music press still think we're the leaders. We're not. They want to wake their ideas up because we've been overtaken. in those days how big boy he was in the states it was suppressed by the record companies um, particularly our original record company um, secret records uh, i think i think what he'll vouch for that and various things as uh, he was told that and we were told that nothing was kicking in the states and it's a lot of old bollocks it was kicking big time in the states and uh, the english band should have gone out there then and ruled the roost and uh, but so we'll, be. we'll get we'll get that crown back. <laughs> Cause I play 
seen any band who had like one rehearsal and half a gig and had one song were all of a sudden on an album um, before really they had the experience or the quality to justify going on that um, and I think a lot of rubbish came to the fore I think now though that you've got labels like Helen Avoy putting out the stuff of vinyl new bands not old groups new bands like Another Man's Poison uh, this sort of stuff which is good there's some good quality stuff but they've paid a bit of their dues first, you know, they've done a few crap gigs and built themselves up and discarded a few songs that they thought were half decent when you first start, and then they've learned how to play a bit better and structure the songs, but, and I think he's putting out at Helen Avoy and even at um, Hammer Records as well, he's doing one or two good new bands, so I think that's good, and I think that's really where they should come through. What bands have got to do as well is respect the punter, and we do, we're one of the, we're renowned for respecting uh, the people that come and watch us play because they've paid the money to get in and they roll the roost not the band the band is doing a show and the band is getting paid for it and if you go on with a half-hearted attitude on that stage you're like fuck you I'm in a band I'll give you set and the other you don't deserve any respect whatsoever it's like I don't know if he walks up to Ed, just say you saw some film star out there and you walked up, just say you were 16, 15, 16 years old, he went, can I have your autograph, please? And the bloke went, no, I haven't got time. He's a cunt. Because he's not having respect for his people. That, and it's those people that have put you where you are. Um, we, we don't earn a lot of money, believe me, but we have respect for everyone that follows the business. <laughs>
common denominator that beats all these bands from the last 15 years or so is attitude. Try as they have, the mainstream music industry has tried to emulate the freshness and aggression of life. And although the majority of the public can swallow, nothing in the last 10 years comes close to the raw power that the early eye bands had. Hand-picked drama graduates pulling a mean face whilst cashing their 50 grand roll checks don't constitute youth rebellion. But the public gets what the public wants. And of course, they only want what they get to hear. So what is life? A working class phenomenon that was snubbed out by the media before it could expose their corrupted money-making schemes? Or a myth created by die-hard fans who refuse to admit that they're getting old? That, of course, depends on who you ask. Maybe that's in the fucking you dog head. You're always in the nick down, aren't yeah. it? We could have made yeah. quite a lucrative living. Right. If we'd had some Playing these shows, right, if right. it hadn't have been for that shit. And I mm. still do honestly believe that because we were a working band and a progressing band and we played music people wanted to hear. As I say, it was always the music, never none of this mythical fucking oi shit which we've already said we didn't understand, never will understand. Like. And I think that stunted our growth mm. and stunted us making, not superstars or any of that shit, but stunted us making a reasonable making living. Making a living and I'm getting our fair crap for what we put in. That's like, right. You know? And I think that that was a direct obstacle. Mm. And no one can explain to me to this day what that is. I don't understand right. what I, that I, I is. I can't find anything because I was never into it anyway, no. you know what I mean? It's a pile of shit I've and, and it means it. nothing, mm. it, it comes to mm. nothing. No. What mm. is it? Like, one of all life's great questions is that when I go up the old pearly goats down there, I'm going to go, what was I? <laughs> yeah. And some people yeah. look at me and go, I don't fucking know. I, I personally haven't got a clue what I've done or abandoned. And I play mine about <laughs> <laughs> Every generation ain't done to its culture. You know, like, you've got the old teddy boys, they're still into rock and roll, they go to the rock and roll gigs. You know, it's like, what we was into, we still into it. Mm. If we was there, you know, it don't go away. I mean, all oh, these people, there's people I know that have got married, and like, I, I am, you know, myself, but people I know that have gone away, they still come back. You know, and if there's, if there's a gig, like, oh, I remember that, it's great. You know, walk down memory lane. Mm. It always be a bit of nostalgia about that. But, you know, no one's been under the illusions that it's ever going to take the airwaves by storm, because it won't. So if it never done it in the early 80s, it certainly ain't going to do it now. Right, so I think if you're happy doing what, doing that, then it's still relevant to people. Because if people still turn up at gigs, and still pay their money for the rehearsal room, and still can be bothered to write the songs, then I think for them it's relevant. And, you know, damn good luck to them, I say. But uh, I think, my belief is that's a mainstream thing, I don't think it's relevant, because at the end of the day, no one cared about us in the early 80s, and even less people care about us now. And that, no, I don't think that's ever going to change. I mean, everyone keeps going on about this um, scene, but it really doesn't exist anymore. What, what's happening at the moment is, is a different version, probably original principles maybe, but it's come out in a different uh, vein. You know, it, it's, it's rearing its head in certain quarters around America, around Europe, but it, it'll never be the same. And people sort of reminisce about old times, you know, but those they, those times will never happen again. You know, that was something special, and, and it should be left as that. You know, but it, and people should move on into the future now. Now, now's, now's the time for a lot of bands to kick their arse in together, and. Uh, and street street rock has to take its place in the music industry. I don't mean in this country. I mean worldwide. It has to take its rightful place because there is a there's a good market for it. I think the time's right for something now because it's become so bland, isn't it? I think the old music business is back to a stage pre-punk, and it's all just got uh, it's all manufactured, uh, and there's all these little um, Svengali's running around with their puppets. Um, and the time is right. I mean, whether it will ever happen again, I don't know. I, mean, I really do think that uh, the thing about the, the new punk uh, or the oi movement was it was so real that it frightened the crap out of all of them. And uh, <laughs> I think it's going to take a long time. But I, I do really think uh, there's time, uh, there's, uh, there's uh, a, a need for that, something to come along and excite things again because uh, it's, it's all got very stale, isn't it? <laughs> Keep the fire! 
Originally, no, that's all right. No. It's originally, you're, put, you're putting me off. I'm not being rude. You're just putting me off. No, I mean. Originally, we was involved in um, punk scene, which was happening in in this area. <laughs> yeah. Sorry about that. It's a bit strange footage for you. Yeah. It doesn't sound good, does it? Uh, oh, it, it, it's really corny. It really is. Fucking, I don't know. Oi, oi. You oi? Oh boy. Yeah. You oi? Used to be. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fuck's sake. XOE. XOE. I'm XOE, yeah. I'm XOE, mate. Nah. I think you can give you another idea. XOE. XOE. And the Dr. Martin site. Moody Timberlane. Snide Timberlane. Timberlane. You want a pair? 25 quid. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Fucking Roman Road Market, let's go on. Excellent. <laughs> I used to be oi, but I'm all right now. <laughs> Fucking hell, oi. What a cunt. I'm fucking lost questions. Say it to do with oi, but. Oi, where's your questions? <laughs> Ich mag dieses Ort der Musik nicht. 